I'm looking for Rose. Is she here? She's not. Rose, I just wanted to thank you for that chanting and for the freedom of it. It was really beautiful. And that song also has a particular history with Ananda, which most of you would not necessarily know. Some of you do. Um, Swami Kriyananda, for a period of time, was married to a woman named Rosanna Golia. As it happened within the last couple of months, Rosanna died. And uh, she was part of a charismatic Catholic group in southern Italy, in Sorrento. And when that association started, which happened before um, Swami was married to Rosanna, it started in 1981, actually. And there was, a, let me just pull this together. Um, they read Autobiography of a Yogi, uh, the group, like 30 Italians who were part of a, a Catholic church there with their priest. And they read Autobiography of a Yogi and wanted to have Kriya. Swami Kriyananda went to Rome in the fall of 81, and the whole group came up from Sorrento to see him, to ask him for Kriya. They weren't qualified for Kriya, because you have to have some experience of our meditation teaching, but he initiated them all as disciples of Master on that occasion, and that, this is just a little history for some of you, that was when becoming a disciple became separated from taking Kriya initiation. One requires a certain amount of training, the other can be decided in a heartbeat. You just recognize where you belong and you want to embrace it. And then as the relationships between our two communities developed and the Italians came to stay in America and then we started, we, this is the royal we, the collective, anybody at Ananda, anywhere in the world who ever did anything, I say we, we started traveling there. And Swami made the interesting comment, he said, I think that the Italian group, devotees, will learn something from us, from Americans, about, you know, we're hardworking, we're efficient, we have, we have a lot of good skills to share. But I think the benefit is going to be from the Italian side to the American. For this reason, because of the freedom of heart, and the freedom, the willingness, as Swamiji said, Americans are always a little afraid of being a, a, appearing foolish. And so we might have, a, we have very strong hearts. I'm just talking in, in um, the essence of each culture, not the individuals. Even though Americans have very wonderful hearts, and we, we have those kinds of experiences, after those experiences are over, we always try to stand back a little bit and make sure we haven't been taken advantage of. You know, because the, the worst thing that an American can do is to appear to be gullible or naive. We always have to be just a little shrewd. And also we get a little worried sometimes about having our emotions run away from us. The way Swami put it grandly is, the Italians got over that a long time ago. <laughs> they don't worry about that at all. And because of that, there's this natural freedom about expressing devotion. And uh, just a moment, yes. At, when Swamiji started going to Italy and being with the Italian devotees, and especially when, when Ananda started its community in Italy, they have a, a long-standing tradition of saints. And whereas we were always a little restrained in our reverence for Swamiji, the Italians got over that a long time ago. And it was when we began to see how they treated him that uh, we felt more at ease about expressing what was in our hearts, but that we were always a little reticent to express. And that particular song, Viene Signore Gesù, um, which also, for those of you who know, if you do a grapevine, it, 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 it follows perfectly. <laughs> we used to dance in circles to that song because it just has the exact rhythm of it. You can do a really simple, beautiful dance. How does that go? Yes. Yeah, like that. That would be how you do it. Anyway, um, 
And what, what that song also, in those long pauses where, uh, uh, where there was, you know, the extemporaneized higher melodies going on, um, also, when they would sing it, their group would sing it, they would often speak. They would just pray into those silences, and the music would go, and then there would be an extemporaneous prayer, and the music would go. And when Rosanna came to live with us at Ananda Village, which she did for a time, in the end, changing languages, changing cultures, changing everything, there were too many, too many things that made it impossible. So she stayed for about seven years, that's all went back to Italy. But uh, she also would do that. And at first she couldn't speak English, so she would pray in Italian. And then Swami would translate. So she would just say, and it would be prayer, not like Heavenly Father, Divine Mother with three phrases and then, a, and then an Amen. It would just be an ongoing conversation. Just a conversation that she was feeling with Jesus or however she felt it, and then she would say it out loud. And in the culture that she was in, everybody just accepted that. And when she brought it to us, I, we never adopted it. It wasn't sincere on our part to imitate it. But we learned something. We learned something really important about how natural our relationship should be with God and how intimate and how friend to friend um, there's a great American uh, clergyman, just a moment, let me drink a little bit here. It's Frank Laubach, he passed away some time ago. He wrote a book called Letters from a Modern Mystic. He was actually a Protestant missionary who went somewhere I don't think it was the Philippines. I can't quite remember where it was. He went somewhere to, con where did he go? Philippines. The Philippines, it was. He went to the Philippines to, you know, bring whatever Protestant ministers bring to those places. And he, oh, he was helping to educate illiterate children is actually what he ended up doing, making a school, I think. And he gradually realized, <clears throat> even though he had this deep belief in Christ, a deep belief in Christ, that he was there for a very different purpose, and that purpose had much more to do with him and his relationship with Jesus than it did with anybody else's relationship with Jesus. And he started practicing the presence of God on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. And that was his letters from a modern mystic. I think he was separated from his family, and he started telling them, Forgive. telling them what he was doing. And all of that is, it's absolutely wonderful to read. If you haven't read that book, you should read it. It's really easy to read. Swamiji had tremendous admiration for him and actually met Frank Laubach finally once and uh, managed, somehow or another, managed to bring himself to uh, his attention. And so... Uh, he had invited him out to dinner. Swami said he was everything that you would think he would have been. He was a very great saint. And uh, Catherine Kairavi at Ananda Village, her parents were, were um, Protestant ministers. And in some context, Frank Laubach came to their school or their church, whatever it was. I think it was a college. I think he ran a college. And they talked about him praying. And everybody is so accustomed to when we pray, there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And they said when Frank Laubach prayed, he would just, it, the way they described it, he would just make audible for a time the constant conversation he was having with Jesus. He would, you could, he just in the middle of a sentence, he would start letting you hear it, and then at a certain point he would stop talking out loud. But you never felt that the conversation had ended. He had just stopped sharing it with you. Now, our reading today, which is about the star of Jesus, and of course, we're coming to Christmas and all of that, 
And as I sometimes say, you know, having for years, every year going through the rhythm of these readings, what is astonishing to me about scripture, and of course he's quoting from recognized scripture, with the, which is the Bible, the New Testament, and the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, I think the way Swami puts it together is scripture in itself. And each time we come into these, and many of you have been listening as long as I've been speaking, and some of you also speak often, take your turn. So this is something that we're all trying to learn. When Swamiji first created the Festival of Light, which just goes the same week after week, he, he talked about the power of repeated ritual. If there is power in the words that are being spoken, because they go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into our subconscious self. And subconscious in this, in this sense does not mean limited. It just means into our, our un, unconsidered self-definition. It just becomes who we are. And even though on the spiritual path we talk much more about the superconscious side of things, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to convert even that which is below our conscious awareness to become our friend on the spiritual path. And that's, you know, the power of the practice of the presence of God. What do I think about? What is the background hum of my thoughts and of my feelings? And when crisis comes, what comes out of me? What melodies do I hum? What images do I think about? When we were traveling in the Holy Land in Israel, uh, the, the, the January before COVID came, whatever year that was, and we went to this uh, cave that had been a place where John the Baptist had stayed. And this was on the second tour that I, that I was part of that month in which we had a group of, of devotees from India who came. Um, our American uh, Dai and Keshava, Shurjo and Narayani brought um, a group of Indians and I helped take them around. And we were in this place where this cave is, which is also a Franciscan convent actually at that point. And there's this cave and it holds about our group, which was 30 people. Shurjo, who's an Indian man, uh, was leading chanting and we were both together sitting out on the, in the doorway to give others the, the whole room, Shurjo starts chanting very, uh, very, very energetically. Uh, I think it was one of Master's chants, but it had been translated into Hindi. So it was Indian words, and he was doing it with a very strong vibration. And just as he finished the chanting, and we were about to meditate, I become aware that there's a big priest standing there and I was sitting on the door frame and he was a big man and he was standing right there like this <laughs> and he says and he looks at Churju who's obviously Indian he says this is a Christian place <laughs> like that <laughs> and with no premeditation no sense of diplomacy or anything out of my heart came these words we're here for Jesus. <laughs> I don't know what happened about, I said something like about maybe we're about to meditate, yes. And then he said, I hope it's a Christian meditation. <laughs> we're here for Jesus. I said it to him again. First of all, it was just too hilariously funny afterwards. And then he sort of huffed and puffed and went away, because what could he say? But for me, I was so happy, because in a moment of stress, and it could have been a big moment of stress, that's, those are the words that came out of my mouth. We're here for Jesus. I mean, there were a thousand other things I could have said to him, probably all, none of which would have worked. <laughs> they would have just been awful. But everything else went away, and all I could think of is, we're here for Jesus. Why else would we be here? You know, it wasn't, it wasn't calculated to win him in any way. He just wanted to know who we were, so I told him. 
We're here for Jesus. And you know, who we are when we wake up in the middle of the night before we have a chance to put on our personality, that's what we're working for here. And at the end, at the end of today's reading, the Bhagavad Gita, the verse is really quite remarkable. It's uh, chapter 4, verse 9, in case you want to go look it up. And in Swami's commentary, the translation is slightly different. But this is what it says. If you can comprehend what the life of these masters is really all about, you'll be freed too. I mean, that's, that's really quite a statement. And what, they're, what he's talking about, what he, being Krishna, <clears throat> and Swamiji is really telling us, is they, they have the power. Their example is not just, oh, I, when I was in Europe, When I was in France, there was this man who was part of the group there, who also, who lives in another part of uh, France. And he does a a lovely ministry there, and it includes a lot of people in in his area, uh, which is is his home place where he was born and raised. And many of them are very devoted to Jesus. And in the course of the time that I was there, he asked me to do a They had some kind of a daily meditation that he leads. He asked me to speak about it, uh, speak at the end of it. And he asked me a couple of questions. And so he asked me something about Jesus, Jesus and yoga. You know, now there's so much you can say. You know, Christ consciousness is really what we're talking about. And the avatars merely express it. And they are perfect examples of this. And there's just so many things that could be said. And I sometimes say them. They're worth saying. You know, they're worth thinking about. But in the moment, I told them about being in the Holy Land and how what a living presence Jesus is, is and just how much I love Jesus. We're here for Jesus. And it, again, it's not premeditated. It's just when you take away everything else, Vieni, Signore Gesù. Come, Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come. That's all that that says. And we're not talking about the second coming of Jesus. We're talking about, come into my heart. Come into my heart now. And the power, um, <clears throat> the power of the lives of these masters is all the philosophy that they express. But when that, all that philosophy is gone, the only thing that's left is our own hearts. Everything about our lives is moved from the heart. Reason follows feeling. Once the feeling is in place, the mind finds all the reasons to accept it. And if the feeling is not in place, the mind just goes on and on and does whatever it wants to do. Swamiji tells a story in The Path about one of Master's disciples who um, had uh, had cerebral palsy. Whatever caused it, I don't know. But it was from birth. And he was very uh, impaired physically, had a very difficult time getting around physically, and he couldn't articulate very well, as we've all, we have all met people who are like that. It's, a, it's an extremely challenging karma to have. And this man was very devoted to master. <clears throat> he was there. He was a direct disciple. But because of his impairments, I'm sorry, my voice is today. Because of these impairments, there wasn't very much he could express, and there wasn't that much he could do. And Master saw him out the window, the, the man with cerebral palsy, I don't remember his name, and said something to Swami about how pleased, how pleased, Divine Mother is very pleased with his devotion. And Swamiji, who was so new and had such a different context of everything, he said to Master, oh, it must be a very simple kind of devotion. I mean, whether the man was was impaired mentally or not, the way he expressed himself was very impaired must be a very simple kind of devotion. Master said, oh, that's the kind that pleases Divine Mother the most. 
And isn't that something for us to remember? In our inclination to get so lost in so many other parts of things, we're here for Jesus. And by Jesus, we mean literally that incarnation whose presence is so dynamically with us right at this time of year. And one of the ways this time of year that we try to get back to the simple devotion is with all these pictures of these babies, you know, like this. This um, Bambino Gesù is uh, Italian. He came from Rome with inside of the Vatican about 25 or 30 years ago. He moved to California. <laughs> Twice in recent years, we have broken him in significant ways. <laughs> the first time was right here when I was moving him, and as Karen put it beautifully later, the little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head <laughs> and separated it from his body. And to this day, I'm not sure how it happened, but I put him on the rug and the two pieces came apart. I was alone in the temple with Atma Jyoti and she heard me screaming out here. It was like two or three days before Christmas. We wrapped him up, I wrapped him up, and there, was a, there is a man in our community who's a luthier who makes guitars, and I took the two pieces of Jesus over to him and he, he put them back together. Um, a couple of years ago, we managed to move him from the basket to the floor um, in such a way that when he hit the floor, he again separated in quite a few pieces. And then Mar Mahavir found someone who can repair these sorts of things. So I realized this morning we have the only baby Jesus who was also resurrected. <laughs> so we're just moving ahead to the end of the story. But it's so important to us, the baby, because nobody thinks about being intellectual or brainy or philosophically sound around the presence of babies. When my friend Purushottama had his two baby sons, two sons, he told me, he said, before his first child was born, he was absolutely certain he would never be one of those ridiculous goo-goo papas, never. He said, once the child is born, you'll do anything. You'll do anything to get a smile or a laugh out of that baby. He said, dignity, who cares? And why? Because the heart just takes over, doesn't it? And so, thank God, literally, thank St. Francis, who really started this reverence, this idea of a living crash, of reenacting the birth of Jesus. Because we, when we're with a baby, we have permission. We have permission to just, who cares? We just can be childlike and simple, which is the kind of devotion that pleases God the most. In India, they're classic bhavs in our prayer. Um, father, mother, friend, beloved, master. Those are the classic bhavs, which is to say how we make a relationship with God. It can be our mother, our father, our friend, our master, our beloved. We say beloved God, but it doesn't really mean dear and much loved God. Beloved means the, rom the romantic love, like Radha had for Krishna, that, that kind of love. But there's another love, which another bhav, which is um, the devotee, and God is your baby. And in India, they have, they have baby forms of much of the, many of the deities. Baby Krishna, you know, baby, he's Gopal, he has a little name even, because if we love the baby, we don't hold back at all. And only at Christmas do we allow ourselves to have that. But the question, the very, very real question, is why? Why do we hold back? I don't mean that <clears throat> we need to become, uh, we don't need to dance in the streets necessarily, unless that's sincere. It's not how we express it, it's the world sees it. But who, who am I in my own heart? And Helen was reading again so beautifully to us today. We don't have to strain outwardly 
to relate to God. He's the nearest and the dearest to us. And again, think of the baby. You know, if you have the little baby, he's right there with you. And, there's, and you hold it, the baby close. And you, you forget yourself because you know the baby's not judging you. There's a clue, isn't there? Isn't there a clue? And also you know that the baby will accept all the love that you can possibly pour into it. Why are we different with the one true beloved who is eternally with us? The baby grows up and goes and lives its own life. The only thing that's eternally ours is the divine. Let us open ourselves. Let us give ourselves. Let us be able to say at all times, we're here for Jesus. You know? That's where our joy will come from. Bless you.